Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to How We Belong, the podcast where we explore the question, what does it look like to belong in today's modern world? I'm your host, Kylie Hodges, and I am so thankful to have you here with me today. We've got a really great episode. Our guest is, truthfully, I fangirled over her when she agreed to do it. Um, And we are going to talk about what finding a sense of belonging really means to her and what it really looks like to her through her life story and how she has expressed that in her art. So let's get started. Today's guest understands what it takes to be able to move out of one's own way to reach what you deeply desire. She's lived it, written about it, and created a path for others to achieve it too. She's the best-selling author of A Carlin Home Companion and an Emmy award-winning producer of the HBO documentary George Carlin's American Dream. Her over 20 plus years of study and practice in Zen Buddhism, coactive coaching, and Jungian imaginal psychology are the foundation for her powerful programs and courses through her Humans on the Verge coaching business. Her passion is to inspire and help others to boldly step into the more authentic, enlivening, and impactful next chapter of their lives. Welcome, Kelly Carlin. Thanks for having me, Kylie. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much for being here. I. You know, I was telling Omar last night that I was I was having you on the podcast. And while I know you personally, I I was fangirling a little bit. I ever since I've met you, I've always found you to be very kind and funny and also very wise and thoughtful. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in just a second. But like the fangirling comes from not who you are connected to, but who I know know you as first. And I suspect maybe that hasn't always been the case for you. So it's a big treat for me to have you here. Oh, thank you. I'm so excited to be here and really excited that you are doing this podcast and and really focusing on this topic. I think it's a beautiful topic that the world needs to yeah. um to dive into. Yeah, I agree. I wanted to break this up into what I see as two chapters in your life, if you don't mind. The first being finding a sense of belonging growing up with your father, George, and being a child of a famous person and navigating that life, and then finding a sense of belonging in life after George. I know it's pretty (laughs) simplistic to divide a life that way, but how does that sound to you? That sounds fine. We'll find our way through all of it. <laughs> well, and you know, I have to say, I read your book, Growing Up with George, A Carlin Home Companion, Growing Up with George, a few months ago, and I really enjoyed it. And I could really hear your voice in reading it to me. So I think that's that should be a compliment that it's Thank you. a good book. It's I appreciate book. it. You're welcome. And um You know, something that I didn't hear that much of in the book, which makes me just think, oh, she grew up in L.A., it didn't really matter, was I didn't really hear a perspective or an opinion on being a kid with a famous dad necessarily. It was more of all the other things that came with fame and like family life at home. Is that an accurate assumption or did I just read the book wrong? (laughs) I think there are definitely elements of it i think the whole book the 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 silent thesis underneath it very much is i mean that's why you know, it, it is about our family but it is about also yeah. the struggle i had to find out who i was yeah uh while being in his shadow and there are definitely moments in it where i mean you definitely see the results of being a famous kids True. You know, famous person's kid living in LA in those eras. And there's a couple of moments where I, I do make a little point of it, like that moment where when I go backstage and um, I walk in to a setting where my dad is and people look at me like, who's this kid? Uh, yes. Why is there a kid here? And then I oh, and then I would like make the point to like go up to my dad to like ask for a dollar for the soda machine or whatever it was. Like, and it was my kind of way of letting people know, hey, I'm on the inside. I'm it, you know, I'm on the in crowd, you know. And not only that, I'm his kid. So, you know, yeah. there was it's kind of a, du- a dual little slight thing going on there, you know, which was, you know, hey, I, I'm cool too. And yeah. that was kind of a big part of of that was because, you know, when you're in a room with a famous person. Uh, 
weird things happen to people's brains. They can't yeah. relax. Uh, all the attention moves to that person like they are a magnet. And so my mother and I would become invisible very, very quickly uh, when we were with my dad and someone else would be encountering us that doesn't didn't know us. Um, and, you know, and, and so I was certainly used to that invisibility, but also really, uh, I think in my own way, wanting to let people know that, hey, we matter too, you know, we're here too. Yeah. You alluded to this and saying that I talk a lot about the circumstances of growing up with a famous adult. And the first thing that comes to me was there was a lot of drug use and abuse um, in the household. And there, <laughs> a lot of that happens with people who aren't famous, but it may have been more accessible. Um, and I, I was really surprised to hear how much, I might say this word wrong, parent parentification. Yes. Was happening with you at a wildly young age. Yeah. As you were witnessing your parents spiral out. Um, and I wonder how much were you in good company with other kids your age at school? Like, was that ever a thing you talked about with your friends? No, nobody ever brought that out of the house. You kept it secret. That was one the biggest difficulty of it and the biggest burden as a kid is you couldn't reveal that to anyone. There was a lot of shame around it. Yeah. Um, and you certainly couldn't reveal it to the adults because you've, I mean, you didn't, I didn't understand exactly that, you know, <laughs> these days I would have been removed from the home most likely, uh, as many of us would have been, but, um, but yeah, you just pretended everything was okay at home. And then when kids would come over, uh, you know, you would still just pretend everything was kind of normal or you would avoid the house at certain times or whatever, you know, there was, and there, and, you know, and kids were definitely my friends. I had a lot of friends who had normal families. And then I had quite a few that had just as crazy families as me. And so you would, it was a different kind of a crazy, but it was like that kind of thing, like, oh, we all know how to pretend everything's fine right now. <laughs> so let's just do that together. <laughs> well, and that is still the case <laughs> in many families. Oh God. Uh, yes. That's why I, I wrote, I mean, that's why I wanted to tell those stories. It wasn't to like go, Oh, look what happened to George Carlin's family. It was like, um, Hey, welcome to the American family. Yes. And our story, while parts of it are unique are actually very much not unique and special. So many people are going through similar strains in relationships in their own households. And this is just one tale of many. Yeah. And and part of the reason what really impelled me, I mean, as a memoirist, you want to tell your story, you're, you're, you feel a need to do that. But really, truly, I knew everything I had lived through in the, in the first, you know, 40 years of my life were things that, you know, whether it would be a toxic relationship, mental health issues, a chaotic childhood, uh, trying to find yourself and your voice in the world. These are all very huge universal themes. And I wanted people to know that you may worship this man, but mm -hmm. he's a human being and therefore you get to be a human being too. There's no shame in any of this. Mm, yeah. We're all inherently flawed. Yeah. And that's okay. It is what doing, it is. We're all doing the best we can here. I yeah. mean, truly, even yeah. in those most chaotic days, my parents were just doing the best they could in that moment. That's all they could, how they could function, you know, and it took me a while to get to that point, but, you know, and that's what good therapy is for. But, you know, uh, in the end, I know that because I know what it's, a, what a struggle it is to just be an adult all the time. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned carrying around this shame and I know you talk about it in the book, but tell me a little bit about, there was a many years of your life where you had a quiet voice in your head that said, I want to be, I am funny. I want to be funny. I want to be on stage. And it, you, you wouldn't listen to it. And I am curious if there was carrying around any sort of shame tied to, I can't be who my father 
is. Therefore, I can't give in to this desire that I have within me. Yeah, I don't I I don't think I was really conscious of any of the comparison shadow stuff really until he died. I just thought mm. I was dysfunctional. Mm. I just thought I was incapable of picking a direction or sticking with something. I didn't realize that I was terrified of having to live up to an audience's idea of who they thought I might supposed to be. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I didn't, it was such a, it was so, it was such a shadow part of my psychology that I didn't, I really didn't see how much it was controlling me. I really just thought I was a fuck up. I, I really, really did. And, um, and I saw, I had a lot of friends who grew up in the business who never went into the business and then other ones who went into it and became very successful. I had, you know, and I see other sons and daughters of people who step into the business and I just, I didn't have the thick skin for it. That's the one thing, like I couldn't be an actor because I did not have the thick skin for it. And I really wasn't good at acting. It wasn't what I wanted to do, but I, I never had anyone say to me, you know, I, I think like you know, I, I think about this a lot, but I never had anyone say to me, you know, Kelly, you're not an actor. You're a comedic actress. You know, you're you're a sketch comedy person or you're you are a Carol Burnett or a Lily Tom. Like characters were my thing. And and there are places you can go to learn how to do that. You know, no one ever said that to me. I just went into regular acting class and felt horribly confused by it all because I was just overacting all the time. And uh and what's so interesting was I was taking an acting class. I ended up being in a really great acting class. And um, this woman came in to sub. Oh, and I'm totally losing her name right now. She was married to David Mamet. And she was, um, she's an actor. And she acted in a lot of his movies. And I was in some scene. And she said to me, um, we're going to stop here. Kelly. I just want to say that you're doing too much. You're overacting. And this was my thing all the time is like, I didn't know how to just be a natural human on stage. I was always pushing. She says, what's going on with you? And she would really sit with you. And, and I said, you know, once we sat with it, I said, you know, what's going on with me is I really truly believe that no one can see me up here and that I'm completely invisible. Oh. And so for the six weeks that she taught us, during acting class, whether I was on stage or not, once or twice a night, she would stop the class and say to everyone, can everyone see Kelly right now? And everyone would turn and they would go, yeah, we can see Kelly right now. We can see you. And I, I actually was like learning that I was a presence in the room. And, and I think it was that invisibility that, um, I didn't know my impact. I didn't know that I was, a, I was, there was a there there for me. And so I never knew how to pursue something like my dad did, or even someone like a comedic actress like Carol Burnett or someone or an SNL person, because I really didn't, I really didn't understand that uh, uh, I could, that, that there would be a, an impact to my output, my creative output, mm. you know, that there was, there was no, you know, I'd, I'd done a couple of roles and things like that. And, and I, I got my first laugh. I remember that. And that was like, oh, wow. But I had no idea what I was doing or how to do it. There was no sense of myself being present. I was so disappeared from my own life. And um, so it, it's just really interesting how long it took me to really find myself and and who I am. And it actually did happen in grad school um, when my dad was still alive, was like, I actually did get to start to have feedback around me about people going like, oh, you know, you're good at this or you're good at that or something like that. And, but it's, it is interesting. Feedback is a really important thing. People always think that artists are like, you know, oh, I'm just going to go out and do whatever I want to do. But getting a reaction from mentors or an audience is is part of the the equation <laughs> especially if you're a comedic actor yes you're it's everything. You're, you're yes anding to <laughs> the audience's reaction yeah yeah absolutely and uh yeah it, 
it and 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 you know and so then when I did when I did start getting a little traction in that kind of stuff it would enter my mind I mean I did have this really high bar inside of my head that it was like I would do something whatever it was even getting my masters or doing a little solo show or doing a story or I used to do these short videos for something called laugh.com um but it was like immediately I had this voice walk in and it would say, yeah, but 10,000 people aren't um, chanting your name and stomping their feet for you. So therefore it doesn't count too bad. Ooh. Yeah. That leads me to the question. That's something I've struggled with, with a really, for a really long time in my life around the sense of your worth is tied to accomplishments. Yes. <laughs> Do you do you still struggle with that or have, cause it sounds yes. like that voice was a struggle with that. Yes, of yeah. course. Our whole culture is shaped by this, right? We only, yeah. you know, um, I was just writing about it this morning actually. <clears throat> and I think, uh, being, an, just being enough, learning to just be and know that that is enough is been for me, I, I think that's partly why I was so attracted to Zen Buddhism, because it's all about being mm -hmm. and it's about non-being in some ways, too, you know, and. Uh, and. And understanding that I am still lovable, even if I don't do anything that just you know because i love people like that's what i started figuring out like well if i love people for just being they don't need to be doing anything for me to love them maybe that's possible for me too yeah but it is it is for sure a one of the voices inside of our head that i think is you know i mean it is a, it it can be a healthy version of that voice too but it is definitely uh, you know, especially around my creativity, it is still a thing. And I've just recently, uh, I mean, for the last five or six years, I've been working as a coach, a uh, life coach. And I was doing that before my dad died too. Mm -hmm. uh, but before five or six years ago, for 10 years, I was completely immersed in my creative life. And I got a, a lot of chance to do that. And then I put it aside for a while to build some financial security because being a creative is not very financially secure. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially someone just like, oh, you know, 99% of creatives. <laughs> yeah. That's the one thing, you know, sure. Yeah. If, you, if you make it, great, yeah. you know. Uh, but I've turned back to my creativity because I am essentially in a, cre a creative, you know. And so the last two years working, I've been trying to like write something. I don't know if it's a book or a show or I don't know what it is yet, but it keeps walking into like, well, what will people think if it's this thing or what will, what, mm. what is it to be now for this? And now people know me as this and this. And, uh, and so, and, and that worry of like, you, you know, I mean, there is a part of me that's like, no, I definitely want to be the legendary superstar i mean <laughs> why the hell not why the hell not and yeah. uh and you, there's a lot of perks to that there's a lot of, there's a lot of there's a lot of non perks too i mean sure. it, it must, it's mostly non perks but but there's a lot of perks and uh but really it's it's that thing of um if you, and it's so cliche but it really is really loving to learn the process more for me now, like really being in the process and getting great joy from writing 10 pages, just rough draft rough, 10 pages of something, knowing it's part of the process, knowing those 10 pages probably will never be seen by another person. But if I don't write those 10 pages, I don't get to the stuff that does eventually get seen by someone, whether it's coming out of my mouth on a stage or, or on the page. And and so it, it it is, you know, 90% of what creatives do is is out of the spotlight, is is not seen by people. Yeah. And I love now that I've come to love the process that, you know, and and I know that this podcast is about belonging. And what I want to 
what I've really, really found in my life is that I got a chance to be on a stage. I've got a chance to, to be out in the spotlight, uh, whether it's for my father or for myself. Um, I've got to play around in that realm a little bit where the light is on me. And for a moment, you feel like you belong. For a moment, you feel like you're part of the cool kids club because you are for a moment, because that's how we look at it in this culture. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you go home and uh, you got to feed the dog and uh, you got to do the laundry <laughs> and you got to figure out what the fuck is for dinner. <laughs> the high wears and, off. And it does. The high wears off. And if you can harness it in a sense, like, well, I worked hard for that thing. And that was a little bit of the payoff and it's a little bit of the fun, but it's so not real. But what is real is that now when I have a creative urge to write something or paint or, uh, or even just do something silly on Instagram with the, with the video, like, you know, like something like that, when I honor that urge to be creative that's when I feel like I really belong to myself because I'm listening to the urge and I'm honoring it and I'm not turning my back on it. And so many of us get urges to do things and we say, oh, that's crazy. Oh, that's stupid. Oh, what will people think? We, we go down that line when if you actually were to feed that urge, you get to belong to yourself more. And and when you belong to yourself, you can belong anywhere. Oh, my God, Kelly. Words of wisdom right there. So what does belong? I mean, I think you you said it, but I, I want to ask this anyway. What does belonging mean to you now? And what does it look like? Yeah, for me, it's. It really does include a an ability to be with myself and my inner life without judgment, to host myself, to host my whims and inner urges, my creative urges, my um, to honor my imagination the spark of imagination, to honor my curiosity, to honor the things that after 40 years as an adult, from I'm 60 now, so 40 years since I was 20, to honor the things that no matter what, I'm obsessed with. Like I, 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 I will not stop being obsessed with the human psyche, um, the imagination, what it takes for people to... Um, find their voice and and step out into the world um what's it like to feel uh like you know and being an outsider and then creating your own community because you've you've shared your gifts in some way um you know i'm just i'm fascinated by certain things and and i realize now that it's like well that's because that's me so so part of it is is taking yourself seriously on some level, like taking what you want and your urges and your slight healthy obsessions seriously and, and not belittling yourself, you know, self-love and self self-regard is really, really a big part of that too, for me um, to really let myself that know that I'm okay. I'm okay. It's okay. You're doing great. You know, I'll say to myself, you're doing great, Kelly. <laughs> you're doing great. Something my dad used to say to me, he used to pat me on the cheeks and go, you're doing great, kiddo. You're doing great. So it's like, yeah, you're doing great. And, and so then, so there's that piece. And then to be able to find people who you are, who, when you are that person and you're in your little, you know, your little sparkly little self that, you know, with all of the stuff that you love, uh, and then you find companions who just get you. They don't have to love the exact same things. Maybe they do some days. Maybe some people don't. Maybe some people do. Maybe you kind of connect in different ways. But but they just let you be. They let you be you, you know? And that for me is an incredible sense of belonging. And, and I think, you know, what 
two places I really started to find that, one of which was when I went to Pacifica and started studying Jungian psychology. And we're like, oh my God, these are my people. They're obsessed with the same things I'm obsessed with. Uh, and then at the same time that was happening, I was also starting to be a part of the local storytelling scene in LA with these small venues, you know, 30 to 40 people in an audience uh, where you would, you know, tell your five to 10 minute story. I got to be in my friend's living room where I got to learn my craft. And I remember sitting, it was right before my dad died, sitting at a wedding from my friend, Wendy, whose living room I was in learning to be a storyteller for four or five years. And I was, I had officiated her wedding and I'm sitting around a table with all these storytellers. And I thought, oh my God, I found my people. Mm. And, and that's such a lovely thing. Um, and I have to say that I don't think it may happen before you're 40, but I'm guessing it's really in your 40s and your 50s that you find this more and more because I think in our 20s and our 30s, we're still so in our head and terrified that we're making the wrong decisions or the wrong move or the wrong path, you know? Mm. Um, after a few decades of making a lot of messy mistakes with your life, <laughs> you're like... I am I'm still here and I'm still like what I like and don't like what I don't like. And I've learned a little bit and, um, and you just, you just kind of feel more comfortable in your own skin even. Yeah. You really start to believe I'm okay. That's what yeah. I mean. it, yeah. it's like, okay. You know, I'm not evil. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, and I guess evil people don't see themselves <laughs> evil either. <laughs> But for the know, record, but, you're not evil. <laughs> yeah, but you, you kind of go like, well, okay, so I'm a decent person. I I try to I try to improve myself. I try to learn from my mistakes. Yeah, do I have blind spots? Yeah, who doesn't? Um, but do I do I try to learn from the blind spots when I finally see them? Yeah, I do my best in that. Um, you know, and and, and so yeah, you, you kind of just start to feel like, okay all right, maybe I'm not such an alien. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to feel a whisper of that now. I'll be 35 this year. Um, and I was just thinking about, you know, I turned 30 right before COVID hit and so much has changed over the last four years. And when I, I was functioning for like the first two years of COVID at this, like very intense level of anxiety that I couldn't pull myself out of. And um, something that you said earlier about taking yourself seriously, I used to always have this voice of I, people aren't taking you seriously enough. You're too big of a, a goofball. Um, no one's going to hire you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I had articulated that once and Kelly, I, maybe this could have been in a retreat that you and I were in, or it could have been somewhere else. And um, I feel like Melissa, my 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 coach and my mentor was there, but I can't remember who else was. But I remember saying that out loud, like wanting to be taken seriously. And then the feedback that I received was essentially like, we do take you seriously. Do you take yourself seriously? Mm -hmm. And I imagine there's, there's, two things that I'm taking away from this, like with age, you start to accept yourself and just calm down yes. <laughs> and also accept yourself and take your inner whisperings seriously. Yeah. So, well, yeah, and you discern the whisperings that you shouldn't take seriously. Also true. Yes. 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 <laughs> like the one saying you're a fuck up yes. or you're an alien. Right. So when you did find your way in fi find that sense of belonging in comedy and in your in your creative self, aside from that moment in the acting class where people are saying, we see you, we see you, was there a moment off stage where you felt a strong sense of belonging in your creative pursuits with everything, but also including comedy, since I know that was taken on later in your, in your creative life. Yeah. It's so interesting because I've, 
always rejected. Uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't live in the world of comedy. I don't work in the world of comedy. I have a natural comedic talent because it's, as my dad used to say, you don't lick it off the rocks. You know, you, you don't, the in apple the bones. Right. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's so funny because one of the things I used to think about with comedy and why I never really pursued it, I think was because with like stand up especially, it was like, oh, I don't want to like, I don't want to be forced to be funny. I don't want to like set out to be funny. I just want to be myself. And if it happens to be funny, great. Uh, so there was always a rejection of that. But when my dad died, something really interesting happened to me. And I had to, and I'm, I'm just starting to write about this right now. And at first it used to bring me a lot of shame but I'm all I'm now seeing it that it just kind of makes sense too. And what happened when my dad died because I'm an only child is I volunteered to be his face in public and his voice in public in some ways because we would have products that would come out and he was getting some awards and things like that. And um and what was so interesting was practically moments after he died. I did not grow up around comedians, by the way. People always assume my dad was like sitting around a room with a bunch of famous comedians and they were all shooting the shit. My dad was very much a loner, did not do stuff mm -hmm. like that. He was yeah. more of a writer. And he came from an era where there weren't comedy clubs and there weren't, you know, he just came from a different era. Mm -hmm. um, and he did, I guess, hang out with comedians a little bit on the road and stuff like that. But anyway, the point being is I did not hang around with people like this. But with the minute my dad died, like practically the minute he died, Comedians started calling me mm -hmm. and what they said to me was, you are family and we are going to take care of you. And it was very profound. There was three people in particular that first week who said those exact words to me, like, we've got you, like, you will always be family. Like your dad meant the world to me and we connected personally in this, this, and this way, and I wouldn't be here without him. And so we have you. And, and so that was a really interesting experience for me because part of it was uh, really beautiful. I mean, I sat on the floor of my bathroom crying on the phone with Carrie Shandling. We were crying together the day after my dad died. I'm like, I don't know this man. I just met him on the phone and we're both crying. And we, he and I became very close friends and he became a mentor to me. Um, but also the part of me, the little kid part of me that always felt so invisible and so outside of the club and knew that she had gifts to share with the world, but could never share them when the other guy was in the room because he was the shiniest one in the room, um, got excited because it was like, oh, maybe I get to share my gifts now. And maybe if these people are my friends and see me, maybe I'll get to find out that these gifts are okay and that I can do this and that I'm just not crazy person living in my head thinking that I've got something to share with the world. And and that is exactly what happened. Uh, uh, Paul Provenza came into my life. He became another good friend and a mentor. And he ended up helping me shape and direct my solo show that eventually became the memoir. Um, and Gary Shandling, too, became my mentor and came to every iteration of my solo show, including the two-hour version where I didn't know what I was doing. I just got on a small stage down at the comedy magic club in their lounge and just told stories for two hours and like, and things that I never wanted to say in public. And I was like, yeah, I just, you know, but it was raw and there was only 10 people there and everyone, and Gary took extensive notes and he helped me oh, in shape and, you know, and love. He gave total love, absolute yeah. love. And, and, um, and there was this you know, there was this part of me that needed to kind of grow up through that because I never really did grow up through that. And so there was a kind of an immature version of me at that time that was still, you know, like, oh, oh I'm hanging out with the cool people, you know, and I'm invited to these parties now and I get to go do this now and I get to do that now because I live a very ordinary life mostly. 
And, you know, even winning the Emmy was like that, you know, that was two years ago. It was like, holy shit. Like, you know, Judd, I didn't do anything to, you know, I was an executive producer, obviously. But what was so interesting about the Emmy thing was, and this is kind of the full circle of this, is that I always knew I had a story to tell. because, And I always wanted people to know the human story. Um, and I and I wanted to tell my family's story. And I got to do that after my dad died. It made him uncomfortable when I was still alive. But I got to do that when, and and Gary helped me with that. And Provenza helped me with that. And my incredible editor at St. Martin's Press taught me how to write for the page and all of that. And all the people that supported me in, in helping me with my craft as a storyteller on stage and on the page. Um, and then we do this documentary, and which was cool. And I got to be an executive producer and they interviewed me twice. And I knew that my job was to tell the family story because I'm the only one that survived and all of that. And then we get nominated for the Emmy. And, and I was so glad because um, they did such a great job. I mean, they did such a great job it's, with it. It's and a I, beautiful film. It really is. And Judd did such a beautiful go job with Shandling's documentary. That, and that's why I hired him. It was like I knew he would do. He's got so much emotional intelligence that I knew he would get that. He, he's not afraid of the human side of people mm -hmm. and showing their vulnerability. And um and and yet it's it what was so interesting was by the time the Emmys came into my life with all of that, I had been through the Grammys and all these other kind of things with my dad and and you know, like, oh my God, I remember going to the HBO thing when my dad was nominated for the Emmy right after he died. And like I said to Bob, well, we're never going to one of these parties again. We were at the HBO party. I'm gonna go talk to every celebrity I've ever wanted to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> and walk up and go, hi, I'm Kelly. I'm George Carlin's daughter. I just want to say hi. I love your work. You know, and they go, oh, George. And everyone loves my dad. So yes. then I'm instantly in. I mean, that I think the reason I'm telling telling you this is because it's a way to belong, right? It's like, For oh, sure. I'm, George, I'm George Carlin's daughter. Oh, instantly I am beloved, unless someone uh -huh. really hates my dad, which is pretty <laughs> rare for me, even in this era. Yeah. Uh, you know, people just adore him or worship him. And, and certainly people in the business, you know, all of that. And so it's an instant, like, and also with celebrities, it's an instant, like, Hey, I'm not, I, I'm, I'm in the, you know, I understand what it's like to be a celebrity. So I'm not going to be here to be obnoxious. I just wanted to connect and say, I really appreciate you. But anyway, it was really, really funny. It was like a super frenzy. It was like 15 years ago when all that happened. And then we get to the Emmys and, um, and it was so interesting because I knew that at first when we were nominated and we went and Bob and I went to like the nominee party and I said to him, you know, I said, I said, even, I said, even three or four years ago, I would have had total imposter syndrome here because it's like, oh, I'm just the daughter. And of course she's the executive producer. They got to give her some kind of credit, right? Or something. But I knew that we got that Emmy or we were, we were nominated for the Emmy and the nomination really was like, this is incredible to be nominated for this thing. But I knew that Judd had leaned in heavily into my memoir to shape the family story inside the documentary. And I knew if I hadn't had the courage 20 years before and then 10 years before that, you know, 10 years before when I did my solo show and got the memoir, that if I didn't have the courage to tell my story, that that documentary would not have been the documentary it is because there was no one else who was willing to tell this part of the story. And, and so I really took it in when we then won the Emmy. I really took it in as this moment of the universe saying, you followed, you followed your urge, Kelly. 25 years ago, you had this urge. You actually stuck with it for decades, kept inching forward, even so it'd be like two steps back, two steps forward, three steps back, you know, like whatever it was, I inched, 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 found my people, found my voice, found my legs, found my courage. The world saw it. And so when, when we, when I, when we got the Emmy, it was such a moment of like, wow, I do belong, but not because of the Emmy and not because it's some fancy club where people get to win this thing. 
it was like, in the end, heart and soul do matter. Mm. And if you're willing to follow it, you will be rewarded. Not necessarily with something shiny and gold. <laughs> But you will be rewarded in whatever realm you're in, and you'll get to see that. And uh, and so it's it's been a really interesting journey around this whole, especially showbiz, because showbiz has just been such a strange beast my whole life. And and what was the greatest thing about was once the Emmy happened, I really did realize, and even when the documentary came out, I realized too, like, oh, I'm done. I'm done worrying about this stuff. I'm done caring whether I'm George Carlin's daughter or not, or if people see me that way or not. I'm done with this part of my story. It's really done. Like I knew I did the Carlins well. It could be really put to bed. And that now whatever I do going forward, it, it is an exploration of being an artist in the world and letting whatever one wants to come out, even if I still want to talk about my dad, it doesn't matter. Um, because it's my psychology and it's my life and it's my, my own personal wrestling with it. It's not about him anymore. And, and that's been an incredible sense of belonging for myself. It really, really has. What is, if, if we're putting the story of George Carlin's daughter to rest, what is the story of Kelly, the artist? I think it's the story of any artist, which is what must, what must be birthed, mm -hmm. what, you know, our, our job as artists is to, to be connected to the archetype of the creator. So, you know, just like, a a a, a you know, any, any, any form that creates any form that replicates itself, whether it's a human having a baby or a plant <laughs> trying to replicate itself or whatever it is, or an animal, um, this is creation is part of that. And so whatever wants to be seen and heard that's coming through me that, uh, that I, that I, that I'm fascinated with, that I'm slightly obsessed with, that I can't put down, you know, you think of, great painters and they're different, you know, the blue period or the cubist period, like they were obsessed, you know, Picasso was obsessed with blue for a while. He had to paint blue. Did he go around going, Oh my God, I'm painting blue. What will people think? No, he just painted blue because it was coming through him. Our job, my job now as an artist is whatever's coming through me. If it's about writing about the last 15 years and coming out of my father's shadow, then that's what it is. I, I got so worried about six years, six or seven years ago. Oh, people don't want to fucking Kelly, get over it. Get over being George Carlin, be, being a daughter, get over it being a daughter. And all. I'm like, but I'm a daughter. I'm always going to be a daughter. And maybe my job as an artist is to talk about family dynamics. Like maybe that's my fucking lane. Who knows? Like stop worrying about it. And I am obsessed with psychology and how we're shaped by our lives. You know, I mean, that's my obsession. That's why I study Jungian psychology uh, and, and other things, whatever else comes through me, you know, it's fine. So it is the story of shepherding along whatever wants to come through me and then letting it come through me. And then always as an artist, your job as an artist is to make sure that However you craft that thing, if you're looking for an audience, if you want an audience to participate in it, to decide how accessible you want that thing to be. Do you want people to understand it easily or do you want people to walk up to it and scratch their head and not really care if they get it or not? Um, you know, and the work I do, which is writing and performing and storytelling, uh, you do want people to get it. Not exactly, but you want people to take a ride and you want people to take a ride for themselves, ultimately. Um, I always want people to instantly find themselves in my story. So my job is to make sure that happens. And I, and I do know how to do that. But uh, yeah, and, and so right now I'm just at age 60, I just want to create. And every time I come up against the, <gasps> what will people think? Is it big enough? Is it shiny enough? 
is, you know, should I be, you know, that comparison thing, shouldn't I be doing this kind of a thing? Shouldn't I be doing this kind of a thing? It's like, yeah, but do you want to do that? Do you actually want to do, <laughs> do you want to take all, do you want to do all the work that it takes to do that? Yeah, no, I don't. Okay. Then maybe you don't want to do that. So the last, let's see you, we lost your dad 15 years ago. Is that right? Yeah. It'll be 16 years next in two months. Yeah. And so the last 16 years for you have been wildly ev evolutionary. Oh my God. Insane. What do you think? And, and some of that goes in hand with age. Like we talked about wisdom comes yep. with age, but also I'm, I'm curious. This is just a guessing game, really. Like if your dad and your mom were still alive today, do you think you would have still been able to go on that evolution or was it necessary for you to walk, as you said, walk out of the shadow of being George Carlin's daughter um, after he has died in order for that to happen for you? Yeah, I was so enmeshed with my parents. My identity was so enmeshed with them that uh, I think it would have been way more difficult for me to do it when they were here. Um, and each of their deaths, which I, you know, I write about my mom's death in the book yeah. and then my dad's death is at the very end. And I write a little bit about it. Each of their deaths gave me a permission, which is something that happens when a parent dies. I've talked to lots of people who've lost their parents uh, at different ages, but especially when you're an adult, there is an accommodation that you no longer have to make to them. And you learn what you've internalized, that accommodation you've internalized, and that ultimately, always, it's your job to decide whether you want to listen to that accommodation or not. I mean, that's really, you know, as a coach, you know, that's really all we do with clients is clients come in with limited beliefs. Those limited beliefs are generally based on their childhood and what they had, how they had to survive. And therefore, we're like, hey, let's try on a new belief about this. And it's really becomes obvious when your parent dies, which ones of theirs are healthy and supportive and good, and which ones you have installed as like the worst case scenario parent mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that they probably really never displayed. They may have. I mean, people have some shitty parents or shitty behaving parents, not shitty parents, but um. But so, but, but most of the time, I think for those of us who are more hyper vigilant, uh, we make up the parental voice way harsher than the actual parent ever was. Mm -hmm. And so it there, you know, there is an enormous amount of reparenting that needs to go on. And I, I, you know, I kind of believe that it's easier when they're not here. Yeah. Yeah. And I really wish I could talk to them. Damn. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the it's the reparenting journey goes through stages while your parents are with you and yes. and as they as they pass on. Yes. And this is such a beautiful articulation of your book too, especially it I saw really as an articulation of finding my sense of self through all of those stages. When I was a kid parenting my parents, when my parents got their act together and I started working a little bit with my dad, when I got married, what my relationships were like. And then after losing my mom, after losing my dad, um, and you're Kelly, you're a fantastic storyteller. You're a beautiful storyteller. Even here, I had to do nothing. You just showed up and gave me <clears throat> such a, such you, you are very, well articulate about your story and able to articulate the things that I feel. And I think a lot of other people feel that they can't touch on. And I do believe, yeah, your, your gift is in art in the form of helping us process our own personal exploration and family dynamics. And there is a lot of things I saw about myself and the way I view my parents in your book. And I didn't grow up with, uh, I grew up with siblings and in a different place and with non-famous parents. So um, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you for putting your your art out there. And thank you for speaking with me about it. I think uh, I know for a fact that whoever listens to this is going to 
be blown away and take a lot from it. Oh, thank you, Kylie. I really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, it's yeah. been. Um, Kelly, great. I want to, um, before we say goodbye, I you do so much and you've talked about you have your business, Humans on the Verge, and you're getting back into your art. Is there anything you want to make sure that people hear? Uh, where can they find you? What do you want them to, what do you want to call their attention to right now? Uh, well, find me on social media because I do hang out there. I'm on Twitter at Kelly underscore Carlin. And I'm on Instagram at Kelly Carlin is here. And through those things, if you need to find me in my bio is always a link tree to find all my coaching stuff. And I'm always talking about stuff or I'm at the barn talking about riding um, or my wisteria in the backyard this week. <laughs> uh, so that's like the easiest thing. And of course, if you just want to go check out my website, kellycarlin.com, it'll get you on my mailing list. If you are interested in anything I do from there, you'll also get to hear about it. And uh, And I'm hoping later this year that I'm going to reintroduce a new podcast myself. I used to do a podcast back in the day called Waking from the American Dream, but I'm going to start a new one. And um, yeah, Dim's always doing new stuff and and hopefully we'll be on a stage. Maybe, I don't know if this year what will happen. I think I'm still writing a lot, but I really do want to get back on a stage and tell some stories. I really want that for you too. You know, I would I would be there. And I really hope you make the podcast. I would absolutely listen to that. Thank you. Kelly, thank you so much for being here. What a treat. Have a wonderful day. Thanks for having me. That's it for today's episode. Please, if you haven't already, subscribe, share this podcast with a friend, rate and review. Every rating and review helps. And if you have any topic suggestions or guest pitches, I am all ears. I'm very accessible. You can find me on Instagram at Kylie Hodges, on TikTok at Kylie Hodges one or you can email me, Kylie at KylieHodges.com. Thank you so much for listening. It means so much that you spent your time with me today. See you next time on How We Belong. Yeah.